On night in November 1983, two aspiring comic book creators, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, sat at home watching television. Now, as Peter watched his television programs, Kevin was busy doodling. What he didn't realise is that he was about to doodle something that would change his life forever. Now, Kevin finished his doodle and handed the drawing over to his friend Peter. Kevin had drew a picture of a humanoid turtle standing on its hind legs with a bandana mask over his eyes and two nunchucks strapped to his forearms. Unknown to Kevin at this time, he had just created Mikey, Michelangelo. Now, Kevin told Peter that it's, it was a Ninja Turtle. Uh, Peter instantly grabbed another piece of paper and pencil and drew his own version of Kevin's strange creation by just tweaking a few things, changing a few things here and there. Now, I think they must have known that they were onto something unique as Kevin drew another picture, but this time he drew not one, but four different turtles and a way to distinguish in between them was that he gave them all their own different set of weapons. One had nunchucks, one had two sides, another had a bow staff, and the last one had two swords. Now when Kevin had finished his drawing, he decided to give the picture a title, and he started to write The Ninja Turtles. And Peter looked at the title and suggested that they add the Teenage Mutant in front of Ninja Turtles. And so, on that night of November 1983, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were born. Now, Peter and Kevin realised that they had just created four very interesting, unique, strange characters. And they also realised that they had the great base idea for a comic book, although at the same time, they had to laugh at how ridiculous the idea was. So they continued for the next few months, creating the very first Ninja Turtle comic book. Kevin and Peter used this time to try and think of an interesting story for the comic book and trying to think up some other interesting characters for the comic book which were just as quirky and would fit into the world of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now when it came to the actual drawing of the comic book, Peter and Kevin both included their own work to each panel they drew and then Peter would then go on to ink the pencil work and eventually the comic book was finished. Now was the time to try and get it published. Now after scraping together what money they could, which included their own savings and money borrowed from Kevin's uncle, they managed to get 3,000 copies of the comic book printed. And on May 1984, under the name Mirage Studios, which funnily enough is the business name they came up with due to the actual lack of an actual studio. Because in reality, their studio was actually the house. And as I said, in May 1984, the very first issue of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles hit the shelves. And Peter nor Kevin were prepared for what happened next because the comic book was a massive, massive hit. Even though they un they'd only printed 3,000 copies, every single copy sold out everywhere. It was a really, really successful first comic book. Now, both Peter and Kevin were very big fans of comic book artists Jack Kirby and Frank Miller. And the book that they created was very much influenced by the artists Jack Kirby and Frank Miller. Uh, the book was also a straight up parody of a certain blind vigilante crime fighter from the pages of Marvel Comics. Yet the Ninja Turtles had a lot in similarities to Daredevil, which I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, the book felt unique, dark and gritty and fresh and even the actual physical book itself broke the mould, coming out at slightly a different size than most of the other comic books that were sitting on the shelf next to it. And to the customer I suppose this made the comic book stand out from the other ones. And you know, before we go on any further, let me just try and give you a bit of an insight into that first comic book and what the story was about. The book is coloured black and white, the art of the book is, is beautiful, dark, gritty as hell and violent. Now, if, if you grow up watching the 87 cartoon series, you might be surprised by the first issue. Because unlike the 1987 cartoon turtles, these turtles in the comic book, they're very different. They don't make jokes, they don't wear multicoloured headbands. It's not a very cheerful place to live in, it's, like I said, it's dark and gritty, and they are very, very violent. The story begins with the four turtles cornered in a dirty back alley by a violent street gang called the Purple Dragons. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's because the 2003 animated series opened up the pilot episode in the exact same way. Even the dialogue came straight from the book, which had Leonardo monologuing. And we'll actually be covering the 2003 animated series a little bit later. Uh, the turtles spring into action, taking out the Purple Dragons with ease, and they're not afraid to spill blood. The police can be heard approaching in the distance, which means it's time for the turtles to disappear. So they flee down the sewer manhole and return onto the sewer layer. And this is where we meet Splinter for the very first time. 
Uh, Splinter goes on to congratulate them on their first fight and informs them that they are now ready for the very first mission which is connected to the origin story which Splinter now tells them for the very first time. Splinter sits all the turtles down and he tells the four turtles how he was once the pet rat of his master Hamato Yoshi, the greatest shadow warrior of the Foot Clan which operated in Japan. Splinter then goes on to tell the turtles that whilst Hamato Yoshi practiced his martial arts, Splinter mimicked his movements from his cage. Now I've, I've never really liked this version of Splinter, I prefer it when Splinter was a man and gets turned into a rat, rather than him being a rat who gets turned into a, like a humanoid rat. Splinter's master was in a relationship with a woman named Tang Shen but unfortunately so was a fellow Foot Clan member named Oroko Nagi who also wanted Tang Shen for himself and became insanely jealous. Tang Shen was not interested in Oroko Nagi, she was in love with Hamato Yoshi and this drove Nagi crazy. Nagi visited Tang Shen when she was home alone and demanded her love but of course she refused. So Nagi began to beat Tang Shen for refusing his advances. At that moment Yoshi returned home to witness the beating and got in a short fight which resulted in Yoshi beating Nagi to death. By killing another Foot Clan member Yoshi had brought shame on the Foot Clan and was forced to flee to New York with Tang Shen and his pet rat Splinter. In New York Yoshi opened a martial arts class and the martial arts class prospered and everything seemed to be going well. However back in Japan Nagi's brother a 7 year old Oroko Saki mourned the death of his brother and he had become obsessed and wanted nothing more than to take revenge on the man who killed his brother. And being only 7 years old he had lots of time to perfect his fighting skills and the foot exploited his anger and used it for their own purpose. Saki was given the task of bringing the Foot Clan over to New York when he turned 18 years of age and Saki found this perfect for setting up his own criminal organisations and taking his revenge on Yoshi. Saki now going by the name of the Shredder and wore an outfit which consisted of a cape, metal helmet and face guard with blades all over his arms and shoulders and legs making him a lethal opponent. It didn't take long before Shredder discovered where Yoshi and Tang Shen lived. Shredder murdered Tang Shen while she was home alone and then simply waited for Yoshi to return. Yoshi eventually arrived home to be greeted by the dead body of Tang Shen and this is when Shredder attacked Yoshi whilst he was distracted and killed him with his blades. In the attack Splinter's cage was knocked over and smashed and Splinter was free but forced to feed on the garbage in the streets and fight off stray cats. One day while Splinter searched the streets for food he witnessed an accident. An old blind man was crossing the street and was nearly ran over by an out of control truck but at the last moment a young man leaped into the road and saved the blind man. The truck came to a sudden stop and a strange canister went flying from the truck and it struck the young man and then bounced a few more times before colliding with a young boy who was carrying a glass bowl of baby turtles. The bowl shattered and the canister and the baby turtles all fell down the open manhole cover into the sewers. Splinter followed and found the four baby turtles covered in the contents of the canister, a strange glowing ooze. Splinter gathered the turtles into an old coffee can and took them back to his burrow, himself now also covered in the ooze. Splinter started to notice that as time passed they were all growing in size and intellect and they all began to speak and stand up on their hind legs. And this included Splinter too who was also mutating. Splinter decided to teach the four turtles the art of ninjutsu which he had learned from his owner Yoshi. Splinter then went on to name all of the turtles from an old book on renaissance art that he found in a storm drain. Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello and Raphael. Raphael is then sent out to deliver a message to Shredder. He infiltrates the Shredder's hideout, taking out a few thugs, then spots the Shredder in an upper window. Raphael straps the notes to one of his sides and throws it through the window and it buries itself into the wall. The Shredder reads a note which challenges him to a fight on the rooftop the following night. So Shredder is given the opportunity to redeem his honour for killing Tanshan and Yoshi and it says in the letter that he would be fighting Splinter's four students. The following night the four turtles meet Shredder on the rooftop and the fight begins. They realise that Shredder is too much to face alone and they fight him as a team. Eventually the turtles get the better of the Shredder and Leonardo stabs Shredder in the stomach right through. But the Shredder still lives so Leonardo offers up his own sword so that the Shredder may commit the act of seppuku on himself. Meaning that they give the Shredder the chance to kill himself with Leonardo's sword. 
At that moment, the Shredder then reveals that he has a thermal detonator and he plans to kill himself and the turtles and he then activates the bomb. Donatello acts fast and throws his bow staff knocking Shredder and the bomb off the roof and Shredder explodes on the way down. The turtles then make a pun about the Shredder being shredded and the book ends. And yet the Shredder dies, they kill off the main antagonist in the very first issue because they didn't actually think there was going to be a second issue. Now if any of that origin story or the characters in it felt familiar to you, let me just try and explain why. Now Kevin and Peter pulled inspiration from different comic books which they both enjoy to read themselves. For example, the very first issue was loosely based on the Marvel comic Daredevil. Now first of all, you have the blind guy crossing the street and he nearly gets hit by the truck. This has many similarities with the origin story of Daredevil, when Matt Murdock nearly gets hit by the truck. And then there's the strange canister, the chemical, which covers the Ninja Turtles. This also has similarities to Daredevil because it was the chemicals that hit Matt Murdock and made him blind. The canister did actually hit a young boy before it hit and smashed the glass ball of the baby turtles. So maybe the boy in the Ninja Turtles pilot, maybe that is Matt Murdock in some kind of weird parallel universe of comic books. Matt Murdock, Daredevil, had a master named Stick. Now the Turtles had a master named Splinter. So you see the similarities there, Stick, Splinter. And then you had the Ninja Foot Clan in the Turtles. And in Daredevil comics, you had the Ninja Clan called The Hand. So you have the foot, you have the hand. But Daredevil wasn't the only comic book that they drew inspiration from. As I mentioned before, Frank Miller was a big inspiration. Also, especially his comic book, Ronan, as well as X-Men, Teen Titans, and another comic book called Cerebus, or Cerebus, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, this comic book featured a humanoid advert character. Now, as I said before, the first 3,000 copies of the comic flew off the shelves and Peter and Kevin soon realised that they had created something very special and that they had more copies printed, which also sold out. Now, it wasn't long before they had to start thinking of creating an issue 2. The only problem was they had killed off their main villain, the Shredder, right there in issue 1 because they never expected to do an issue 2. Like I said before, they, they never even expected this comic to take off. They weren't prepared for the success of the first book. So, issue 2 was made, and the character's personality started to form. Raphael was based loosely on Kevin's own characteristics, whilst Donatello was based loosely on Peter's. April was actually based on an old girlfriend of Kevin's. Now, it's worth mentioning that the characters that appeared in the early comics differed a little compared to what we came to know now, especially after the first animated TV show, which came later. The pre-orders for issue 2 came to 15,000 copies and Kevin and Peter realised that they had made a profit of $4,000, $2,000 each. They realised that they could easily make a living making these comic books, but more characters were needed. Like April O'Neil, the female lab assistant of Baxter Stockman, another main character that was introduced who was like a mad scientist. April is saved by the turtles from Baxter's robot mouses and they became friends. Casey Jones, who was introduced as a crazy vigilante who wore a hockey mask and carried multiple sporting goods as weapons. Now, it wasn't long before Kevin and Peter realised that they needed to expand Mirage Studios and take on some extra members of staff to help them produce the comics. And so that's just what they did. And they actually used a lot of the characteristics from the staff members and incorporated it into the characters in the comic book, just like they did with themselves, with Raphael being like Kevin and Peter being a little bit like Donatello. And so now Mirage Studios was fully up and running and the comic book was doing really well. But it was about to explode in popularity in many different ways, uh, which would take it so much further than being just a comic book. The comic book was doing really well and it wasn't long before Kevin and Peter started to receive lots of calls from licensing agents who wanted to represent them and turn Kevin and Peter's creation into a toy line. But for one reason or another Kevin and Peter were never really won over by this and no deal was ever made. That is until they met licensing agent Matt Friedman. Now Matt Freeman had instantly fell in love with the concepts of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and he fought really hard to work for Kevin and Peter and bring the turtles into the mainstream. Matt wanted a 5 year deal but Kevin and Peter were reluctant so they gave him 30 days to go out and bring back an offer that they couldn't refuse. And as I said Mark really saw the potential of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and really wanted to work for them uh, so he accepted the offer. 
So Kevin and Peter sent Mark out with only two things to seal the deal. They gave him the very first issue of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic book with a note attached to it which read, Go out and make me a million dollars or else, along with a four foot foam replica of a Ninja Turtle. And off he went to make the deal of his life. But Mark soon discovered that it wasn't going to be that easy. Problem was, everyone seemed to think that the concept was laughable, that it was ridiculous. They didn't see the potential in the Ninja Turtles. Mark was turned away time and time again. No one understood the idea of the Turtles, and they didn't seem to realise how good it could be. But nevertheless, Mark persevered and tried and tried all he could to get some kind of deal for Peter and Kevin. And of course his trying paid off when a company called Playmates Toys decided to take on board the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and produce a toy line that would definitely turn their company around. But even at this point Playmates still had to pitch the idea to the big bosses. Another problem that stood in the way was how violent the original comic book was. So they needed to make some tweaks here and there and then present their pitch. Unfortunately the pitch did not go well, they, they just couldn't seem to convince people that they were onto a winner. And so it was then decided in order to sell these toys, it might be a good idea to have some kind of animated TV show to create a backstory for the Ninja Turtles to cover an origin story, but without the violence and the adult tones that the comic book had. And to get this show on TV sets for kids to see whilst they ate their breakfast on a Saturday morning. And after all, it worked for He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, which was originally a toy line that really needed a TV show to help sell the toys. So eventually a deal was made and Playmates decided to pay for the cartoon to be made and they produced the first 10 action figures which were Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello, Raphael, Splinter, April, Shredder, Bebop, Rocksteady and a lone foot soldier. And it wasn't long before the TV series found its way onto the television sets in front of kids on Saturday morning. But still, even though the cartoon was out there, Playmates still found it hard to sell to the actual retailers. You see, no one wanted to take a chance on the toys because they just seemed too ridiculous. That is until Toys R Us took a chance and ordered a shipment of the figures. And it would seem that the staff at Toys R Us could not get these figures on the shelves quick enough. As soon as these figures hit the shelves, they just sold, they sold like hotcakes. And of course it wasn't long before Toys R Us ordered more, and this time the order was considerably bigger. Turtle Mania had truly begun. The cartoon was on every child's TV set and it was bringing in great ratings so it absolutely dominated kids TV. The action figure line was selling almost too fast to meet demand and the next logical step was to design new characters, new vehicles and accessories, clothing, backpacks, lunchboxes, you name it, they did it. And I of course like everyone else, I absolutely adored the cartoon. I watched the cartoon every chance I could get. Whenever it was on TV, I was there in front of the TV watching it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the cartoon TV series now before we go any further. So from the moment the cartoon actually begins, as a child you know it's something special. The theme tune for starters was still and probably is one of the most catchy, recognisable TV intros ever produced for a kids TV show. gentleman who was actually responsible for coming up with the theme tune for the Ninja Turtles, the guy who actually wrote it and I think he actually sung it, was a man named Chuck Lorre. Now if that name sounds familiar to you, well that's probably because Chuck Lorre is actually responsible for some of the biggest TV shows we've had. These include Grace Under Fire, Sybil, Two and a Half Men and probably his biggest hit of all time, The Big Bang Theory. And it's not only the theme tune that is amazing, the animation in the actual intro is really high standard, it's fluid and it's beautiful to watch. And this is also true about the first five episodes that aired in 1987. Now the five initial episodes that we got to sell the toys, they, they always seem to me to be animated to a much higher standard than the episodes that would follow. Or so it seemed to me anyway, the, the animation and the shading just look superior in some way to the later seasons. This may be due to the animation director who worked on these initial five episodes and I don't think he was brought back to do the rest of the cartoons. Uh, the gentleman's name was, I'm going to pronounce this wrong I know but I'll give it a go, Yoshikatsu Kazai. And I presume he was given a decent budget for the initial five episodes and that's why they came out looking so, so sweet. Now as the series went on, for the most part the characters were voiced by the following. Uh, Leonardo was voiced by Cam Clark, Donatello by Barry Gordon, 
Michelangelo by Townsend Coleman, Raphael by Rob Paulson, who would also go on to voice Donatello in the 2012 CGI animated series, Splinter was voiced by Peter Renaday, April by Rene Jacobs, Shredder by James Avery, who was Uncle Phil from The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and Krang by Pat Fraley. The show aired on December the 28th, 1987. The TV show needed to be changed considerably from the original dark and gritty comics to be more child-friendly. One of the big changes that was made was to the Turtles. Instead of them being violent and dark, the Turtles needed to have slightly different personalities. They become more comedic, silly and wacky. They started to use more catchphrases like cowabunga, turtle power, radical, tubular and so on. And they also developed a fascination with pizza, which wasn't in the original comics. And the same also applied for other characters. Take Shredder for instance, he was still the bad guy, he was still evil, but he was nowhere near the same character as he was in the comic. April was no longer a lab assistant. In this, she was now a reporter for Channel 6 News. And another big change was Master Splinter's backstory. It differed massively from the comic books. And as I mentioned before, Splinter's origin story in the 1987 cartoon is the one that I actually prefer. So let me just walk you through the first couple of episodes of the Ninja Turtles cartoon. The first episode starts with April O'Neil reporting on crimes in the city that seem to be committed by groups of ninjas. When April finishes her report, she is confronted by a gang of thugs and chased into the sewers of all places. Luckily for her, she is saved by the Ninja Turtles that make easy work of the thugs from the shadows. When the fight is over, April asks her heroes to step into the light and they do so, and when the turtles are fully revealed for the first time, we can see a few differences compared to the comics. First of all, they look more easy in the eye, almost almost cute I suppose compared to the comic books. Here's a, a few of the main changes that were made. First of all, they all had initials written onto the belt buckles that's supposed to tell them apart. And then there's the turtles bandanas, the masks. As I said in the comics they were all red, but in this new cartoon version they had all been given a coloured bandana and elbow and knee pads. This was done so children could tell them apart and are supposed to sell more toys. You can't have four Ninja Turtles that all look the same because they just won't sell, but if you put a different coloured headband on each turtle figure, then you have to have a collection of each one. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure as you all know, Leonardo wore blue, Mikey wore orange, Donnie wore purple and Raphael stayed in the red colour. Now back to the story, April faints and the turtles take her back to their lair. When she awakes, she meets Splinter and he begins to tell her the origin story. Now in the comics, Splinter was a pet rat before he was mutated and belonged to Hamato Yoshi, his owner. Now in the cartoon version, Splinter is Hamato Yoshi. There's no Tang Shen and there's no Oroko Nagi. There's just Hamato Yoshi and Oroko Saki who is of course the Shredder. Now, Hamato Yoshi and Oroko Saki are both members of the ninja clan, The Foot, which operated in Japan. Now, in the cartoon, Hamato Yoshi was actually a teacher of The Foot clan, and Oroko Saki Shredder was insanely jealous of him, and he wanted nothing more but to get rid of Hamato Yoshi. So, one day when the Grand Master paid a visit, all members of the clan were expected to bow before their master and show respect, but just before Hamato Yoshi was supposed to bow, Oroko Saki made his move and pinned the back of Yoshi's robes to the wall with a dagger. When Yoshi failed to bow, it was seen as an insult, and then when he pulled the dagger out from the wall, it looked as though Yoshi planned to kill the master of the clan, and was thrown out, and he fled to New York, where he lived in the sewers as a homeless man, among the rats. One day, a young boy was walking past on street level and dropped his ball of baby turtles down the drain and Yoshi found them and cared for them. Meanwhile in Japan, Oroko Saki, the Shredder, had taken over the Foot Clan and used them for his own criminal interests. Back in New York, Splinter awoke one day to find the turtles crawling around in purple goo, a mutagen. No canister in this version, it just appeared from a sewer pipe. Now because the turtles had last been in contact with Yoshi, the turtles became half human, half turtle. But Splinter had last been in contact with the rats, so this made him half man, half rat. And then the story goes on to tell how he named them from his renaissance painter's art book and he taught them all ninjutsu. And that is the origin story of the cartoon in a nutshell. Now as the cartoon went on we discovered that Saki had come to New York and was now known as the Shredder. We saw the creation of Bebop and Rocksteady and we were also introduced to Krang, the alien brain with a face from Dimension X who it was seen was Shredder's boss. 
Now there was actually a similar version of Krang which was in the original comic books but it wasn't actually as one character but as a race, a race of Krangs. And these were like alien brain like creatures called Utrums. Back to the cartoon, Krang needs Shredder to build him a body so he can move about more freely and become an uh, actual weapon. The body Shredder builds is a massive Frankenstein monster-like creation. In fact, they actually parody It's Alive line from the movie. Now when it comes to the actual body that Shredder builds, it's, it's very strange to look at. The best way I can describe it is blubbery. Krang is placed into a compartment in the stomach where he can control the body and he also has the ability to grow massively. And I also believe that Peter and Kevin actually hated the design of this Krang body. They actually hated it so much, uh, but it was too late. It was already animated and put into the show. Rocksteady and Bebop were also introduced into the five part mini season. Two of the original thugs at the beginning in episode 1 who attacked April and they were later mutated into a warthog and a rhino to help fight the turtles. Although they were not the smartest villains in the world, often messing up and making mistakes. Now Bebop and Rocksteady were not originally in the comic books, although it was Peter Laird who created the characters especially for the TV series. And it wouldn't be long before we would see Bebop and Rocksteady actually join the comic books and become fan favourites. Now, as far as Shredder, we have covered his origin story in the original comic and cartoon, but what about the Shredder's personality in the show? Well, in the comic, he uses a foot clan for drug smuggling, selling weapons and assassinations and was a ruthless murderer, a no-nonsense villain. And actually, in the initial five episodes that were released for season one, Shredder is actually quite cunning and dangerous. However, as the series went on, Shredder's personality did seem to change a little bit. He was still evil, but he did always seem to fail to defeat the Turtles, although he did at times seem to be the better fighter. As soon as he was beaten in the fight, he would run off like a coward, and it wasn't unusual to see him have a tantrum if things weren't going his way. Quite a change from the violent killer in the comic books. And then we have the Ninja Turtles themselves, whose characters had changed a little since their comic book origins. Michelangelo, for instance, in the comic books, he was more easygoing than his brothers, but also with a serious tone and ready to fight. However, in the cartoon, he was more fun-loving and given a bigger role. He was also known as a party dude. In fact, he was even given the title as a party dude in the main theme. Uh, Mikey also had a weakness for pizza even though all of the other turtles had a weakness for pizza too, but they didn't seem to have as much of a weakness for pizza as Mikey did. He loved to joke around, he spoke with a surfer dude slang, and was constantly used in the show for constant comic relief. And it is said that the voice actor was responsible for the cowabunga catchphrase, which wasn't actually scripted. And then we have Leonardo, who in the comic, he isn't actually referred to as a leader at first, but always led his brothers into battle and is said to be the more skillful turtle and highly disciplined. Now, in the cartoon, he is more or likely the same. It does actually say it right there in the theme song, Leonardo is the leader. In the cartoon, he can come across as bossy and this can annoy his brothers from time to time. He is sometimes portrayed as the goody two-shoes. And he can also be the teacher's pet, but it has been proven in some episodes that the turtles rely on him a lot for his leadership skills. And then we have Donatello. Now in the comics, Donnie is actually portrayed as the second in command and was quite the handyman. He was quite good at fixing things. In fact, in the early episodes of the comic books, there's um, a storyline where they have to retreat to a farmhouse, quite similar to the movie, which we'll get onto later. Uh, and he was actually seen around the farmhouse fixing many different items, such as, such as a farmhouse boiler. And he also builds a windmill and a water wheel to provide electricity. Now, in the cartoon, he's viewed as a tech geek genius who can pretty much make anything he puts his mind to. He builds the turtle wagon. He builds a blimp. He also builds the, uh, the turtle comms, the walkie talkies that they use. And he can also invent portals to other dimensions as well as many other out of this world creations that nicely move the plot along in the cartoon. And the last turtle is Raphael and in the comic Raphael is a big hothead, always first to fight and prone to anger. He is also the most violent of the four. But in the cartoon, Raphael's personality is extremely different than any other version released since. In the theme tune, he is introduced as a cool but rude turtle, and he's the most sarcastic of all his brothers, and is quick to poke fun 
and his violent tendencies are completely toned down, and he is used a lot for comic relief, along with his brother Michelangelo. And another character I'd like to talk about is Casey Jones. Now, he wasn't actually in the first five episodes, but I think he is an important character to talk about when it comes to the 1987 series. Now, in the comics, Casey Jones is actually the hot Ed Vigilante, actually quite quite similar to Raphael in many ways, who likes to dispense his own kind of justice on the criminals. And when it actually comes to the cartoon, I, I wouldn't actually say they toned him down, I said they actually turned it up a notch. In the cartoon, Casey Jones is a muscle-bound, unhinged vigilante who wears a hockey mask, like in the comics. But in the cartoons, the relationship between him and the turtles is different. Instead of being a friend of the turtles, which, which he is, he is a friend of the turtles, but he is more of a nuisance. And the turtles often had to calm him down. It's actually... Funny, watching these episodes, as a kid I didn't realise this, but the voice actor for Casey Jones sounds a lot like a parody of Clint Eastwood. Now, as I said, Casey Jones didn't play such a central role in the cartoons as he did in the comics, and he only actually appeared in five episodes after the 193 that actually aired on the television. And next, I want to mention the differences of the Foot Clan between the comic and the cartoon, because I feel it will segue nicely into what I want to discuss next, which is the violence that is depicted in the show. In the comic, the Foot Clan are the most feared clan of warriors in Japan, skilled and dangerous, and were particularly good at assassinations. In the cartoon, they were changed considerably, obviously they can't have assassinations in cartoons. Although in the cartoon, the Shredder does actually bring Foot Clan members over from Japan, it is presumed that somewhere between coming to the US and meeting the Turtles, Krang must have created his own robotic Foot Clan. In episode 1 of the cartoon, it seems as though the Turtles are actually holding back when they are first confronted by the Foot. But as soon as they discover that they are robots, they seem to be more happy with this revelation and unleash their weapons on the Foot, easily beating them and throughout the series, the Foot never really posed much of a threat and are easily beaten. Now the reason the Foot were robots was obvious, it's so that the Turtles had an excuse to use their weapons, after all you couldn't use your weapons to stab a living villain on a kids TV show, but robots, robots are fine. In fact, the turtles' weapons were never actually used to cause harm, instead they were used to help them in different ways, such as cutting a net to fall on the enemy, or throw the weapon to disable a trap, or something of that sort. But even though the cartoon was really kid-friendly, it would seem that some countries were still not convinced and went on to heavily edit some of the action scenes, especially the UK. Now, in the UK at the time, the word ninja was taken out of the title and was replaced with the word hero as it was thought the word ninja was far too violent a word to have in the title of a cartoon in the UK. So, the cartoon in the UK was called Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. <laughs> throughout my childhood, that's how I knew it. Also, any scene of Michelangelo using his nunchucks were also cut from the cartoon, because at the time, nunchucks were also illegal in the UK. Also, the intro was heavily cut, removing a few Mikey shots with his nunchucks. Another thing removed from the main theme tune was the word ninja, just as it was removed from the titles, and the word hero was inserted into the theme tune. And the word ninja was also replaced with the word hero on all merchandise released in the UK. Along with the nunchucks, they were also removed from all merchandise, including early video games. It wasn't actually until season 4 when the people responsible for making these cartoons actually addressed the issue of the censorship and they started to give Michelangelo a grappling hook to fight with instead of the nunchucks to avoid any messy editing done by TV networks. And then the cartoon kept the silly, wacky, fun tone for many seasons to come. Uh, that is until season 8. At the time, the X-Men cartoon was doing very well, and it was a much darker, serious series than the Turtles was. So from season 8, the Turtles cartoon had a big change, visually and story-wise. 
although still in the same timeline as all the other episodes that came before it, the episodes that came after it became darker and it got a brand new title sequence and song. The title sequence had clips from the 1990 movie included in it. The design of the turtles also changed. They looked less child friendly and more meaner. And the stakes were higher. This was no longer a cartoon where the bad guys constantly failed. In one episode, Shredder actually succeeds at blowing up the Channel 6 news building and reducing it to rubble. And I think if I remember rightly, that's how that episode actually ended on a somber note rather than a happy one. Now the final three seasons of the Turtles cartoon are known as the Red Sky episodes and this is due to the changes in the colour of the sky in the cartoon which were all now coloured a dark moody red. A bit like the new adventures of Batman, they had a similar colour palette as well for their episodes. Now whilst we're talking about the cartoons and before we move away from the cartoons, I think it's worth mentioning that there was a second comic book that was started and it was more child friendly and followed the cartoons more closely but diverged by issue 5. Uh, the comic series was known as the Archie Comics run and it ran from 1988 to 1995 and had 72 issues as well as annuals. And now back to the cartoon, it actually ran for an amazing 10 seasons before it actually came to an end. The cartoon went on to be the longest running cartoon TV series of all time. That was until a few years later when it was beaten by The Simpsons. And so the last episode of the 1987 Ninja Turtle cartoon run ended on the 2nd of November 1996. But something that I failed to mention happened in 1990 during the height of the cartoon, when it was decided that the world would be treated to a full length live action Ninja Turtles movie. The movie is in my opinion, and I suspect in most people's opinions, the best version of any live action portrayal of Turtles to date. This movie to me is it's just perfect. It actually takes a lot from Peter and Kevin's original comic books, which is what I believe is a reason for its success. The dark, gritty tone of the comics can be seen in every scene in this movie. And it's very earnest and it feels so real. Well, you know, with the exception of four mutated Ninja Turtles and one mutated rat, it's as real as it's ever gonna get. Uh, saying that, I remember seeing this as a child and being so excited to see this. I, I think it may have been the first time I'd ever seen a movie at the cinema. And I remember absolutely loving this movie. And it soon became one of my favourite movies. And I can say that my VHS tape got a bit worn out over the years. I also remember being a little bit disappointed because you see the only exposure I ever had of the Ninja Turtles was the 1987 cartoon and at the time I had no idea that this was a violent adult comic book before it was ever turned into this child friendly cartoon. So of course on first viewing of the movie I was thinking many things. Where is Bebop and Rocksteady? Where is Krang and the Technodrome and Dimension X? Where's the turtle wagon and the blimp? Why is April wearing a yellow jumpsuit and so on and so on? These were all elements of the 1987 cartoon that I really wanted to be in the 1990 movie, which weren't. But of course at the time, like I said, I didn't know about the comic book. So looking upon this with adult eyes now, I can really appreciate this movie a lot more than I could as a child. And it was made on a very modest budget of 13 million and it made over 201 million worldwide. And in my opinion, when you compare it to some of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies we've had recently, and I'm, I'm talking mainly about the Michael Bay movies, there's just no comparison that this is a better version. Well, at least in my eyes. I don't know what you think, but in my eyes, this is the superior movie, the best movie that we ever got of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But before filming actually started, not a lot of people believed that this movie would be successful. And this was down to the failure of a movie that had been released not long before. And this movie also had its own animated series and its own toy line, which was very successful. And this movie was... the masters of the universe and it bombed it bombed at the cinema hard and it was a complete failure but looking back at this movie which i actually liked as a child i like like most people back then i was a massive he-man fan but one thing that this movie did not do it didn't stick to the source material 
and it just ruined the movie, having them fight the battles on Earth, instead of having them fight in the fictional land of Eternia like they always did in the cartoon. But you know, all that is for another episode, I'd love to revisit He-Man in, in a later episode, but for now let's just get back to the turtles. So, as I said, because the Master of the Universe was a complete failure, not a lot of people had faith in a live-action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Now, tr trying to get this movie signed up with a studio proved quite difficult. Once again, just like with the toy line, people initially thought this was a crazy idea and it just wouldn't work. Now it's one thing to have the Ninja Turtles in an animated series where it can totally work, where imaginations can run wild, but to bring the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to a live action movie, not a lot of people were just buying into that. That is until the people at Golden Harvest Studios decided to take a chance on the Ninja Turtles, but not without caution from the studio. They were still doubtful, but nevertheless the movie was given a budget of 3 million, a very low budget due to the head of production at Golden Harvest believing the movie could be made for, for peanuts. Uh, the next step was to get the creators Peter and Kevin to agree to the movie. And after a few disagreements from Peter and Kevin, who always had final say over their creation, the film was given the okay. And then director Steve Barron was brought in to direct the movie. Now, Steve Barron at the time had only worked on music videos. He'd, he'd actually directed Michael Jackson's Billie Jean music video. And Steve was chosen because of his visual style that he brought to his music videos. Um, they believed that he could bring some of that style to the Ninja Turtles movie. And it wasn't long before Steve had a vision in his mind and how he wanted the movie to look and how he wanted the movie to feel. And he, he took a lot of elements from Tim Burton's 1989 Batman movie which had just changed the way comic book movies would be viewed forever. But Steve also had his own vision in mind, what he wanted this movie to be. He wanted there to be a very real vibe to it. Make no mistake, his vision was set in the real world, and the turtles were dropped right into it. But he was also aware of the animated show, so fun and humour was essential. What Steve did was take issues 1 to 10 of the original comic book run and pull from them scenes that he wanted in his movie, like the fight at the antique shop, the retreat to April's countryside farmhouse, and the rooftop fight scene with Raphael and the foot. Although in the comic books it was originally Leonardo who fought the foot alone and that was changed slightly because it was thought that it suited Raphael's personality a little bit more for this movie. And Steve did all this with the help of the screenwriter Todd Langdon who used the comics to rewrite the original scripts. Now even the original story was taken from the books although there were small changes but nowhere near as much as the animated show. For instance in the movie Splinter started out as a pet rat his owner was Yoshi, and Yoshi was in love with Tang Shen, just like in the comic book. Now when it comes to the Shredder and Oroko Nagi, in the movie there is no Oroko Nagi, the Shredder's older brother doesn't exist in this, what they've kind of done is took the two characters and merged them into one. The Shredder is the one who kills Tang Shen and Yoshi, like in the comics, and Splinter is once again set free from his cage and then jumps to Shredder's face gnawing at him, and Shredder slices off Splinter's ear and leaves. New York is having a major crime wave, and April O'Neil is making waves whilst reporting on the matter. After leaving work one night wearing a yellow coat, which is probably paying tribute to the cartoon version of April, who wears a yellow jumpsuit, she is attacked by a group of thugs. The turtles appear, and Raphael smashes the street light with his sigh, and the turtles defeat the thugs in the darkness, and then flee back down the sewer. Problem is, Raph forgot his sigh. Next, we see the turtles in the sewer celebrating their first battle, but Raphael is in a major mood because he lost his weapon. We meet Splinter, and the puppet for Splinter is absolutely fantastic. There's a trilogy of these movies, and it's the best version you're going to get in this first movie. As with the turtle suits, they get worse as the films progress. Splinter realises that Raphael is in the mood and he tells Raphael to just forget about the weapon, but he can't. Uh, the turtles continue to celebrate and Raph goes to watch a movie. After the movie he witnesses a purse snatching. He trips one of the two thugs, retrieves the purse and gives it back to the woman. The mugger runs into a near park area and that is where we meet Casey Jones who intends to beat the thugs for their bad deeds. Raphael intervenes and the thugs run away. Raph and Casey start to fight. Casey eventually hits Raph with a cricket bat, sending him flying through the air and into a trash can, and Casey runs away. Raphael gives chase but fails to catch him. The next day, April is reporting on the crime wave. Shredder sees a report on the TV and orders some of the Foot Clan to silence her. She is confronted by the Foot Clan in a quiet subway station and knocked unconscious. Luckily for her, Raphael has been following her so he can retrieve his sigh. 
Raphael beats the Foot Clan and grabs April and takes her to the secret lair, unknown to him that he's been followed by a lone Foot Clan member. So after April comes round from being unconscious, we then get the origin story again of Splinter which we have just discussed. After Splinter has finished telling April the origin story, they return to April's apartment for pizza. Later that night, they discover that Splinter has been taken and their home has been ransacked. They return to April's apartment until they can come up with a plan. April's boss comes to her apartment with his son Danny, who spots one of the turtles momentarily in April's flat and tells the shredder where the turtles are hiding. Back at April's apartment above the antique shop, Raphael and Leo have a falling out and Raph goes to the roof to be alone and cool off. A few blocks away, Casey Jones just so happens to be sitting on a rooftop and spots Raphael and the Foot Clan who are sneaking up on him. Raph is attacked and outnumbered on the rooftop by the members of the Foot Clan and they beat him unconscious and throw him through the skylight. The other turtles run into his aid and the Foot Clan all crash into April's apartment. A fight breaks out and everyone falls through the floor into the antique store. Casey Jones arrives just as the fight is looking a bit grim and joins in. The shop catches fire during the fight and the turtles, Casey and April, flee to the country to an old farmhouse that April owns. Raphael is unconscious for a good while, then makes a recovery. They hide out there at the farmhouse for a good while until they learn their last bit of training, when they all meditate and contact Splinter mystically. The turtles decide that they are ready to return to New York City and confront the foot. When they return to the old lair, they discover April's boss's son, Danny, hiding. When the turtles fall asleep, Danny returns back to the Foot's hideout to try and save Splinter. Shredder confronts Danny and finds out the turtles are back. Luckily, Casey Jones followed Danny to the hideout and helps him free Splinter, and after a fight between Casey and Shredder's second in command, they leave to return to the turtles. Meanwhile, the Foot Clan have attacked the turtle layer and a huge fight has begun between the turtles and the Foot that starts in the sewers and then progresses to street level. And eventually the fight ends up on a rooftop where they make quick work of the last few foot members. But then the Shredder arrives on the rooftop and a battle between Shredder and the Turtles breaks out. The Turtles quickly realise that they are no match for Shredder and eventually he gets the better of all of them, especially Leonardo, who he pins to the floor with a spear next to his throat. After he makes Raphael, Donatello and Michelangelo throw away their weapons and before he can kill Leo, Splinter arrives and lets Shredder know who he is and that he was the one who scarred Shredder's face as a pet rat. Shredder removes his mask, revealing the scars, and then Shredder charges at Splinter with the spear, but Splinter uses Mikey's nunchucks on Shredder's spear and flips Shredder over the side of the building, and holds him there. Shredder grabs a dagger and throws it at Splinter who catches it, but lets Shredder go and he falls to the garbage wagon below, and Casey Jones flips a switch that compacts the garbage and crushes the shredder and it would seem that Casey Jones is a stone cold killer in this, a stone cold murderer. All pretty serious stuff for a kids film wouldn't you say? And then the movie ends with the turtles celebrating with Splinter on the rooftops and as they all shout cowabunga and high five, the credits roll to the Partners in Crime single which was made especially for the movie. And before we move on, while we're mentioning the T-U-R-T-L-E Power song from Partners in Crime, I just want to say that when this when this song came out in the 1990s, I absolutely loved it and I could not get enough of it, even though they said that Raphael was a leader in the lyrics, which absolutely drove me mad at the time. I was like, no, it's Leonardo, it's not Raphael. But I absolutely loved that song. So, in the 1990 movie, they followed the grim story of the comic, and as a kid, I hated how Splinter was a rat to begin with, and as I've mentioned this before, I found it hard to accept that he learned ninjutsu as a pet rat. Even as a kid, I found this hard to accept, but now I can I can overlook it because this film is just it's brilliant. And so the next step in trying to get this movie off the ground was to get someone to do all the animatronics. Now, Steve had worked previously for Jim Henson, who was the creator of the Muppets and the movie Labyrinth, as well as other things like Sesame Street. Initially, Jim Henson didn't want anything to do with the movie, not because he found it ridiculous, but because of the comics violence and the adult theme. Steve managed to convince Jim to make the turtles for him after promising that the film was going to be made with her and taste. 
and will not tarnish Jim's legacy. And so work went ahead to create a new kind of puppet, possibly the most advanced puppets to ever grace a screen at that time. And of course, now with Jim Henson on board, the budget was going to have to be considerably higher. Three million just wasn't going to cut it. And they actually achieved a higher budget by going to different distributors such as Virgin and New Line Cinema. And they also made a deal with Domino's Pizza, as the Ninja Turtles love eating pizza. It was a great idea to get the product placement in there as well. And eventually the film was up and running and two sets of turtle costumes were made. The first set had all the wires and electronics fitted within the suits, mainly in the shells, and these controlled all the facial expressions on the heads. The second costumes were free of wires and electronics and allowed the actors inside to do all the stunt work and the martial arts that was required for the fight scenes. And next there was the casting process to actually put people in these costumes as I was researching this film, I found that a few of these actors who interviewed for the part and got the part actually had some interesting stories about what actually went on in the interview. Michelin Sisti was in the Michelangelo suit. In his audition, he did a roundhouse kick to impress the director and put his foot through the wall. He thought he had blown his chances until Steve broke out in laughter telling him anyone who put that much effort into the audition deserves to be in my movie, which I, I think is a great story. And then Robbie Rist was cast as the voice of Mikey, so the guy inside the suit was just doing the martial arts and the stunts, but Robbie Rist was the actual voice actor who voiced Michelangelo. Now the actor in the Raphael suit also had an interesting story to tell. A Mr. Josh Pice, he remembered the intense body cast experience when they had to cast a suit around his body. They actually gave him two straws to breathe through by poking the straws up his nose as he was completely covered in the plaster. And he was actually told later that they kept him in the plaster longer than needed just to see if he would freak out or not. And it's worth noting that Josh also voiced Raphael. And then we have the actor who was in the Donatello suit, Leif Tilden. Now he recalls being in the audition, sitting in an office surrounded by movie props. He recalls seeing Falco's head from the never ending story in one corner and a Yoda puppet in the other. And he absolutely loved it and it's one of his, his fondest memories from any audition he's ever done. And the actor who played Leonardo, uh, David Foreman, he, he didn't really have an interesting interview story, but it is worth noting that he actually played a thug in the movie, as well as a Ninja Turtle. In fact, all the Turtle actors had cameos. The guy who played Mikey played the pizza delivery guy at the beginning of the film. Donatello actor played a foot member. And the actor who played Raphael was the passenger in the taxi seen after Raphael and Casey Jones have the fight in the park. Leonardo was voiced by Brian Tukey. I think that's how you pronounce that name. And then we get to the Splinter Puppet that was operated by Kevin Clash. Uh, it was an advanced hand puppet and Kevin wasn't actually in the suit, he was more or less underneath it, away from the camera. And Kevin also voiced Splinter. Uh, the actors had a hard time in these costumes, it did get very hot and claustrophobic with all the electronics in the suits and on occasion the heads would have to be torn off to cool the actors down and let them breathe and drink fluids. Occasionally sickness was unavoidable. Uh, the heads would be glued on to seem seamless and sometimes they would malfunction and the actors would be trapped inside for some time hours and on occasion they would absolutely freak out and shout for the crew members to just come and rip the heads off. Now the, the actor who played Raphael commented how everything that could possibly go wrong with the suits went wrong. He also said that the suit helped him play the character of Raphael better, who was a very frustrated and angry violent turtle. And the actor actually said that the suit made him feel exactly the same way. And of course we also had the following actors playing these parts. April O'Neil was played by Judith Hogue. Casey Jones played by Elias Cortez and Shredder played by James Saito and Sam Rockwell also appeared in the movie in a very small role as a Foot Clan thug. Just a little bit of trivia there for you. And of course Sam Rockwell went on to much bigger things in his film career. He's, as you know, he's, he's in a lot of good movies these days. It is also worth mentioning that Jim Henson, he was around on occasion but not constantly and sadly Jim Henson passed away shortly before the film was released. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie was Jim Henson's last project. The movie's shooting locations and set designs were all throwbacks to that original comic book. 
and some set pieces of streets and rooftop scenes looked almost identical to the pages from the comic book and especially the sewer layer the turtles lived in looked a dirty, disgusting place to live, as it would do, after all, if it was a real sewer. The film needed to be sped up in certain scenes involving the turtles to make the movements look a little bit more fluid and convincing, especially the fight scenes, because as you can imagine for these actors in these suits doing these stunts, the movements were probably slowed down considerably because of the sheer weight and clumsiness of the suits, so probably speeding the camera up just helped it look that little bit more natural. And of course the tone of the film was very dark and the actual sets were shot in the shadows, in dark surroundings, which actually did the film wonders. Now the film needed to be heavily edited for its UK release, once again just like the cartoons, and once again it was down to Mikey's weapon of choice, the nunchucks. Like I said, when, when I was a kid, my VHS was worn out, but little did I know that I was watching an edited version with parts missing. It was only when I purchased the DVD in later years did I see the film in its full glory. But it wasn't only Michelangelo scenes that were dropped from the, the movie. Um, let me just talk you through a few of the scenes that were cut initially from the UK release. Now you remember the scene after Raphael gets beat up on the rooftop and he's thrown through the skylight and then all the Foot Clan members come down after him and then Michelangelo and one of the other Foot members start having a, a nunchuck competition and who's more skilled and you know they're, they're all spinning the nunchucks around then Michelangelo spins his nunchucks around and it ends with him spinning it around on his finger and he wins the competition that bit was completely cut out of my version of the uh, the VHS tape so it was it was quite nice to actually see that in the DVD release it's a it's a really good scene the bit where Splinter throws Shredder over the rooftop then momentarily holds him before Shredder throws his dagger at Splinter and forced to drop him well, that scene was cut out of my VHS tape as well. What you actually saw was Shredder running at Splinter, and then Splinter wraps the... Well, actually, you didn't even see the nunchuck. You just kind of see this, this quick movement, and then you see Shredder flip over the building, and then you just see him straight away just drop. You don't see Splinter holding him and doing his little speech. You just see Shredder just drop straight away down to the garbage truck. Uh, there's a scene where the foot are trying to hack away at Michelangelo with the axes and Michelangelo's just spinning around on his back and he's, he, he comments on the Wheel of Fortune joke. That bit wasn't in my VHS copy either in the UK. That was very annoying. Not that I knew about it at the time. And then there's the bit in the farmhouse where Michelangelo comes in from training and I think a lot of those training clips were also missing from my uh, VHS release because obviously they were using some of the weapons that weren't allowed to be shown on screen and there's also a scene where Michelangelo comes into the farmhouse after training and he's he's got sore muscles and he grabs a turtle wax out of the cupboard and I oh, that's it's, it's quite a funny scene but I don't remember that being in the VHS copy when I was a kid either and I believe I may be mistaken but I believe that the German release had the same edited version as the UK release as well. But saying all that, strangely enough, the title of the movie kept the word ninja in it, unlike the cartoon. Unlike Masters of the Universe, the Ninja Turtles movie was a massive success, and as I said, it made a massive 201 million worldwide. And I'm sure you agree that that is not a bad profit at all for a movie that was made with only a 13 million dollar budget. Now, as good as this movie was, there are a few goofs and a few movie mistakes. There were a few times in the movie where the actors and the suits can actually be seen. One particular goof happens in the scene where Leo and Raphael are sharing a hug after Raphael has been beaten up on the rooftop and, and they've escaped to the farmhouse and he finally wakes up from his coma. You remember the scene where they're sharing the hug? Well, Donatello comes in and starts poking fun and he starts laughing and tilting his head back. And as he does so, you can actually see straight down the turtle's mouth and you can see the actual actor's mouth inside the actual turtle head and it looks quite disturbing to see two sets of teeth, the turtle's teeth and the actor's teeth coming out of the head. And there's also a scene, the scene where the turtles are leaving April's apartment for the first time and it can clearly be seen that Leonardo's swords are made from rubber props as they get caught on the wall and bend quite easily. 
Also, the scene where Raphael gets thrown through the skylight and crashes down in the apartment below. When the turtles go to check on him, you can see that the shell is clearly made of a sponge-like material. The best mistake is seen when Leo and Raph are arguing in April's apartment, and as the camera moves back, you can see a member of the crew in the background trying to stay out of the shot but failing miserably. He was probably controlling the puppetry, but I don't know how this was missed, because he, he can clearly just be seen in the background. It's just a guy in a, in a red cap just, just knelt down in the background of the movie is no right whatsoever to be in that scene but there he is always notice him on that scene I can't, I can't not notice that even with all these mistakes the movie is still brilliant there's no denying that it's it is the best version in my opinion of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles we have ever had so the first movie was released it did very well so of course the sequel was already greenlit and it, it was in the works but in between the first movie and the second movie being released turtle vans were treated to a live musical tour featuring the turtles and friends the tour was called the coming out of the shells tour and it all started on august the 17th 1990 and the first show was broadcast on pay-per-view the band featured leo on guitar donnie on keys Mikey on guitar and lead vocals and Raphael on drums, saxophone and vocals. Splinter, April and Shredder would also sing a few songs. The show, which was sponsored by Pizza Hut, would have the Turtles performing on stage for their fans whilst the Shredder and Baxter Stockman tried to ruin the fun. The tour also released an album as well as home VHS tapes. Now the tour isn't considered a particularly good show and to be honest I have, I have no memory of it, I, I think it was just in the US, I don't remember this at all. But as bad as this show seems to us now, I'm sure as a kid whoever saw it back in the day would have absolutely loved it and I have fond memories of it. The, the costumes also were not particularly good. Then again like I just said this was for kids and I have no doubt that the kids watching this at the time just found it magical. Now it, it wasn't long before we got the sequel to the first movie. In 1991, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Use, was released. But unfortunately, it could never compare to the first movie, even with a budget more than twice the size of the first movie. For instance, the, the whole feel of the first movie, the grittiness, the way it followed Peter and Kevin's comic book run, the script, the, the director, all of this was missing from the second movie. The first movie did really well, so they wasted no time whatsoever in churning out the second movie. And maybe that was part of the problem because this movie was rushed. The visuals on the second film looked very clean and very colourful, but it didn't feel grounded in the real world like the first movie did. The costumes did not look as good as the first movie. They looked less real than the first movie, more colourful and more cartoon-like. Another problem with this movie was the violence, it had been extremely toned down a lot, in fact all of the turtles had their weapons but they never actually drew them. For instance, in a fight they would rely now on kicks or punches, there was one scene where you saw Michelangelo fighting with a yo-yo and you saw Donatello fighting with a foam toy. There was a scene where Raphael actually used his sigh but only to catch a pizza. And then after that scene, you very rarely saw him use them again. Actually, I would say that the size remained in his belt for more or less the rest of the movie. There was another scene that I can bring to mind where Leonardo actually used his swords, actually used them to throw into the ceiling, and then he jumped up and he hung off the swords and kicked the enemies while whilst he was hanging off the swords in the ceiling. It was just ridiculous that, that they weren't allowed to use the weapons. The movie's plot revolves around the ooze that created the turtles. Oh, and the Shredder. The Shredder is back now and it would seem that he survived and now he's hell-bent on mutating his own creatures to fight the turtles. But if you were hoping to see Bebop and Rocksteady in this movie, you're going to be disappointed. This film takes place one year after the events of the first one. This always frustrated me due to the scene where we see Shredder's hand burst through the garbage on the dump and we discover that he survived. So does this mean that the Shredder had always been lying in the dump for a whole year? I mean, we see that the turtles are now living with April in a new apartment since her last one was burnt down. Now, are we, are we meant to believe that the Shredder has just arrived back from the dump, but the turtles have settled down and April settled down in this new apartment, so it's been a year, and he's he survived all this time in the dump? Another thing is, I, I always told myself that Shredder's return must have been a flashback to the same night he fell, as the foot had all arrived to the fallback spot, 
and Tatsu, Shredder's second in command, was still pissed about the Shredder's death in the scene that we see in the movie, which is depicted as being straight after the events of number one, although it doesn't match up. The, the timelines don't add up. I mean, you've got the Turtles who have been living with April for a year after the events of the last movie, and then you've got the Shredder and the Foot Clan meeting up at the dump directly after the events of the last movie. It just didn't make sense to me. I just put it all down to bad writing. Now, uh, Jim Henson's workshop did come back for this movie, but as I said before, I, I don't think the look of the turtles was quite right. This could be due to Henson's death. I'm not sure if his presence would have made a difference or not, but as he died just before the release of the first movie, and this film is actually a tribute to him. Another thing that was a disappointment was the absence of Judith Hogue as April O'Neil. Judith played April in the first movie, but in, in this movie she's replaced by Paige Turco. Paige was fine, she was, she was a good April, but it's just a shame not to see the original actors come back. Now, apparently Judith wasn't invited back due to conflicts on the first movie. She didn't agree with the, the amount of violence in the movie. Uh, Casey Jones didn't appear at all in this, and this was probably due to Casey Jones being such a violent character in the first movie, so it was probably deemed unsuitable for kids in this toned down version. The actor who actually played the Shredder in the first movie didn't return either. This never actually bothered me as a child because Shredder's behind a mask so you never really notice that. But it is worth mentioning that the Super Shredder at the end of the film where Shredder's mutated into this big hulking monster uh, was played by WWF wrestler Kevin Nash. And then we have the two mutated creatures which were a wolf and a snapping turtle who were named Toka and Raza. Now as a kid I was I was very disappointed that we weren't getting Bebop and Rocksteady and I, cu I couldn't understand why. Why weren't we getting Bebop and Rocksteady? And apparently it was due to Kevin and Peter refusing the characters to be placed in the movie. Apparently they never liked the characters of Bebop and Rocksteady. They thought they were too goofy. So Toka and Raza were created which is baffling because these two creations were also equally as goofy if you ask me. The two characters did later show up in the 1987 series, computer games, Turtles Forever movie, the comic books and the 2012 series. This movie also saw the temporary departure of Corey Feldman who did the voice of Donatello in the first movie. This was due to Corey being in rehab at the time, although he did return for Ninja Turtles 3. On this movie we saw the inclusion of a new character named Kino, played by Ernie Reyes, who was actually a stuntman in the first movie and was given his own character to play and I, I didn't realise this at the time but Ernie Reyes has been in a few other movies that you may, you may recognise. One that sticks out to me is the movie Red Sonja starring Bridget Nielsen and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Ernie actually played the spoiled young prince and he also had a role in the movie Surf Ninjas but at the time when I was a kid and I used to love watching these films I never made the connection and it's interesting to see now when, when I watch them now on TV I think oh yeah that, that's him, it's obvious it's him but at the time I never, I never really made the connection. This movie also features Vanilla Ice at the end of the movie when the turtles do a little dance routine whilst fighting. Apparently one of the actors who played one of the turtles went over to give Vanilla Ice a hug in full costume because he was a big fan of Vanilla Ice and he wanted to just go over and just say hello and yeah, give him a hug for some reason. Unfortunately he never got to give him a hug due to Vanilla Ice's bodyguards intervening and they apparently shoved the actor and then a small scuffle broke out on set. It's also worth mentioning that this movie was supposed to be part of a bigger story that would continue into the third film. Apparently this second movie was supposed to be more alien in theme. Uh, there are rumours that the scientist in the movie was actually supposed to be Baxter Stockman originally, not Professor Perry, and it was also planned to have Stockman and Perry reveal that they were in fact an Utrum, which is an alien brain creature that would have resided in the st in a stomach compartment of like a robotic body which would have been the Professor or Baxter Stockman. And it's worth mentioning that these Utrums were a lot like the character Krang in the 1987 series, but they featured a lot more heavily in the comic book and they were actually a race rather than just one character alone and apparently this wasn't included into the film because they didn't want the kids to get confused with the Utrams and Krang which is, if you ask me, why didn't they just do Krang? Early drafts of the script also had small robots that were called Mousers and they were actually in the comic books as well but this was also scrapped so all of these new characters were supposed to tie into a third movie which would feature the Utrams and the Triceratons which was a race of alien dinosaurs. Uh, they were probably abandoned due to time restraints and probably budget. 
The movie was rushed and made in just one year since the last, in fear that the franchise would fizzle out of popularity. And what I forgot to mention with the first movie was that Playmates produced no toys whatsoever for the release of the first movie because they believed that it was too violent and they refused to make action figures. However, that was not the case with this movie. Playmates made the figures that were different, better detailed, and instead of hard plastic, they were made from a kind of rubber material. Possibly another reason for the toned down violence of this movie was to purely sell more toys. We only needed to wait two more years. In 1993, we got the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 movie. In a nutshell, in this installment, we follow turtles who need to travel back in time to ancient Japan to save April, who were sent back in time after buying an ancient scepter at a flea market, and find themselves in the middle of an ancient battle between a rebellion of villagers and the Lord Noriagi. Now, meanwhile, back in the present, we see the return of Casey Jones, who is played by Elias Cortes once again. He makes his return to the role, and Casey is there to look after Splinter due to the time travel rules. For every person who travels back to the past, they're replaced in the future. So the turtles were replaced by four honor guards. Elias also plays a character in the past. Meanwhile, back in ancient Japan, the turtles find April, who has been kept prisoner. They rescue her and flee back to the village, which is run by the rebels. We also see the introduction of Walker, an English weapons trader who wants to provide weapons to Lord Norinaga for silver and silk, but then changes the cost to gold when he realises that the turtles are the ones fighting on the opposite side. The turtles have the task of defending the villagers whilst trying to make a replacement scepter so that they can get back to their own time, due to them losing theirs earlier on in the movie. This is probably regarded as the worst movie, although saying that, I can see where they have made an effort to bring us a better movie, but ultimately they've they failed. But before I tell you all the bad points, I'm, I'm going to try and concentrate on some of the good points. I'm going to try and be positive about this movie. The first good point about this movie is that we actually see the turtles actually using the weapons in this one. Not a lot, but it's that uh, we actually see it more than in the second one. Another good thing about this movie is that Casey Jones is back, but he's back in a really toned down version of his previous self from the first movie, really toned down. Corey Feldman returns as the voice of Donatello, which I actually like. Sets and costumes, not the actual turtle costumes mind you, the actual set costumes are actually quite good. Fortunately, that is probably it for all the all the good things I can say about this movie. And uh, now for the bad. First of all, the absence of Jim Henson's workshop is very, very noticeable. In this movie, a company called the All Effects Company took over from Jim Henson. And from the start, you can tell the quality of these suits is without a doubt worse than any other that have come before in the Ninja Turtles 1 or Ninja Turtles 2. Uh, the bright colours just look off, they look shiny, they've got massive bulging eyes that roll around all over the place and they look quite freaky. They've got huge distracting teeth. Splinter also look considerably worse than in the previous movies. The, the story is pretty weak. It was loosely based off a two-part comic story that was no doubt superior than this movie. Another negative is that this movie version didn't include any characters from the comic books or the cartoons. They just simply seem to create their own. Uh, like I said before, Casey Jones is back, but you won't see him wear his hockey mask and crack some skulls. And in this, he is reduced to a glorified babysitter. Although we do see Alias Cortis play a different role in the past, it does not seem to be linked to Casey at all. Although saying that, there is a scene where April seems to recognise him and think it's Casey Jones for a split second. And I think there is also a scene where Raphael mentions that he looks like someone he knows, something like that. Like I said, I always presumed it was Casey Jones and he had some kind of ancient ancestor. And it would have been nice if they had maybe hinted to this or mentioned this, but they never, they never did. They never, they never mentioned this at all. The next movie was going to be called The Next Mutation. If that sounds familiar to you, that's because they get a TV series a few years down the line called The Next Mutation, and we're going to be discussing that on the next episode. But in this movie that was originally planned called The Next Mutation, the concept was that the turtles were going to go through a further mutation, including Splinter, turning them into bigger creatures, bigger mutants, and would give them different abilities. Donatello was going to gain telekinetic abilities, but as a result, he would have weaker eyesight, so he would have to wear goggles that helped him see. He also had a different bow that looked mechanical. Leo had a new ability to morph his skin into a chrome-like surface. Mikey would have the ability to project human features over his turtle appearance. 
and Raphael could morph into a raptor raf, and he would hulk out and get sharp claws and sharp teeth. Uh, Splinter also would have had a similar ability where he could morph into a bigger rat mutant with massive claws and teeth and become like a hulking creature like Raphael. And there were also talks about introducing a fifth turtle named Kirby after Jack Kirby, one of Peter and Kevin's heroes. And although this never happened, the fifth turtle would be introduced in a later project. Like I said, we'll be getting onto that later. And so this uh, fourth Ninja Turtle movie never saw the light of day uh, because of the failure of the third. But Ninja Turtle fans did not need to despair, or did they? Because you see, in a few more years, the 1987 series would come to an end, and then a little project in Japan, a two-parter anime special of the 1987 cartoon, like a kind of continuation of the 1987 cartoon, but it was very, very strange with a lot of Japanese anime extras added in. And the short film, let's say, was called Mutant Turtles Superman Legend, roughly translated into English. Now we're going to go back to the 1987 cartoon briefly, um, we're actually going to go back just before the 1987 animation came to an end. There was actually a Ninja Turtles Japanese anime named The Mutant Turtles Superman Legend, roughly translated from Japanese. The cartoon was never released in English, but I do believe there is a, a dubbed version done for fans that can be found on YouTube. The animation style in the cartoon is actually based on the animated series from 1987. It does look quite similar. Everyone looks the same, the designs are exactly the same, but then you have the usual anime madness thrown in that you will find on in any Japanese anime film, if you know what I mean. Um, it's like a kind of continuation of the 1987 cartoon as it was coming to an end everywhere else. Now, I don't know whether they intended to make any more of these cartoons. What I can tell you is they only made two, and that was it. I believe the whole reason behind the making of these two cartoons was for one reason only, and that was to sell toys. And they did, they did actually get these toys on the market. They looked like big kind of Gundam, Gundam wing Ninja Turtle figures, if that makes sense. They were, the Ninja Turtles were heavily armoured. So let me just give you a little bit more of an understanding of what the actual plot was to this uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Japanese anime. And for that, I'm going to go over to a wiki page and just read out the plot for you. Episode 1 was called The Great Crisis of the Super Turtles, The Saint Appears. This was broadcast in May the 21st, 1996. The turtles explore the temple of the lost Muta Kingdom, where they free the spirit of light called Cry's Mew, who was trapped inside the Muta Stone. In reward, she gives the turtles the ability to perform super mutation, which transforms them into super turtles for three minutes. When all four super turtles combine into one, they fuse into an almighty turtle saint. At the same time, Shredder and Krang find the Dark Muta Stones, and they try to awaken the demoness Dark Mu contained inside the crystal. And episode 2 was called The Coming of the Guardian Beasts. The Metal Turtles appear. The turtles, among with April and Splinter, travel to Japan in order to help Kinzu Hattori help get rid of a ghost haunting the Hattori house. And at the same time, Shredder, Bebop and Rocksteady teleport themselves to Japan in order to seal the tablet of the seven elements so they can gain powers of the Guardian Beasts. So that's a wiki summary, I'm going to now try and describe in my own words what this cartoon was like and it is a very strange cartoon. As you know, some animes are, some are awesome, some animes I find totally fascinating and brilliant and then some I just find totally strange and this one falls under that category. Now in the cartoons, as I just mentioned in the plot, the turtles have these stones that can transform them. Uh, when the turtles use these muta stones, which is what they're called in the cartoon, they become enhanced and they look a bit like, the, the best way I can describe it, they come a bit like tall, muscular Wolverine characters, like Wolverine out of the X-Men. Uh, due to the helmets they were really, it just looks like the Wolverine mask. The animation is very good in parts and some characters, although they look more or less the same, they do look slightly different. For one, they are all drawn and animated slightly better than the 1987 episodes, but they also have that um, anime flair to them as well. The big differences, I'd say, are Shredder and April. Shredder looks more sinister, and he's been given a brand new outfit and design, whilst April looks more or less the same, except from her face. She definitely looks more anime in the eyes. Now, in my opinion, this cartoon has some impressive animations, but makes no sense whatsoever 
whatever and the story is just bananas and it is actually can be quite annoying and frustrating to watch but like I said that is just my opinion and my opinion alone it has created a little bit of a cult following so there's obviously some people out there who like it but I think in general I think most people tend to think that it is a strange addition to the cartoon it's, it, it definitely is give it a watch and see what you think but in, in my opinion I, th I think this this two-parter cartoon series was just purely and simply made just to sell the very strange toys that they brought out to coincide with each one of the episodes. And so back in the US, as the 1987 series came to an end, the Ninja Turtles needed a new TV show. And it was decided that the next project would be a live action TV series like the Power Rangers made by Saban and Fox Kids. Unfortunately, this was probably the lowest point in the Ninja Turtles history. And so back in the US, as the 1987 series came to an end, the Ninja Turtles needed a new TV show. And it was decided that the next project would be a live action TV series like the Power Rangers made by Saban and Fox Kids. Unfortunately, this was probably the lowest point in the Ninja Turtles history. Instead of the fourth movie, which I told you about in the last episode we did, we got this TV series instead. The turtles look different than in the movies, the bandanas for one, they now covered the whole head, apart from maybe Raphael I think. They also saw fit to change the Ninja Turtles weapons, Leonardo now only carries one sword in this and Michelangelo now fights with Tomfas instead of nunchucks. Now as I mentioned in the last episode there was plans to make a fourth Ninja Turtle movie and in that movie they were going to introduce a fifth turtle called Kirby. Now, in this TV series, they did actually introduce a fifth turtle, but it didn't go down very well. The fifth turtle in this was called Venus de Milo, and she was a female ninja turtle, which was reluctantly given the go-ahead by Peter Laird, which would probably go on to prove to be a big, a big mistake. Venus de Milo is possibly one of the biggest upsets about this series. She was not liked at all, and still to this day, she, she is considered to be one of the worst ever characters introduced into the Ninja Turtle franchise. Nobody really likes her. Nobody at all. Now, in the TV series, Venus de Milo is sent to find the Ninja Turtles when her master dies. Uh, apparently, she was with the other four turtles on the day of their mutation, but she was taken to Japan and taught the mystical arts of the shinobi. Now, first of all, people hated her design. She was given a blue bandana, like Leo's. Uh, I'm not sure why she didn't get her own colour. Maybe pink would have been a good idea for a girl, maybe, or any any different colour, yellow. Um, but they give her the same colour of Leonardo to make it different and to make her more girl-like. They actually braided the tail of the bandana, what, what comes down the shoulders, they braided it as if it was her. And probably perhaps the most laughable thing about this character is that they actually chose to give her turtle boobs on the front of a shell. Now, Venus was introduced into the show to be some kind of a love interest for the Ninja Turtles. You can see that they're all pining over her. They've never met another female turtle before, so obviously they're all they're all drooling over her. But the, the problem with this is they're all brothers, so does that mean that she's the sister as well? So this kind of plays with incest a little bit, and it gets a little bit weird and a little bit strange in that sense. So what they actually did, they actually changed the origin story, and so it was established that all the turtles were just pet shop turtles, and they had never actually been related. They were not blood brothers. And of course, as you can guess, this idea was hated. Not None of the fans of Ninja Turtles liked this idea. They wanted them to be brothers like they had been in the comic books and in the 1987 cartoon. And another thing that would be hated would be the costumes that they use in this TV series. Now, if you cast your mind back to the third film, if you thought those costumes were bad, you could be swayed into thinking they were actually acceptable compared to these ones that we got in this uh, TV series. Take the animatronics for one, the animatronics in the faces were awful. The mouse really moved in sync with the audio. Master Splinter was now a man in a suit rather than a puppet and he looked absolutely terrible. This all actually reminded me of the coming out of the shell tour we covered earlier in another episode. The costumes were just as bad as they were for that show. Now, another negative, you didn't have any April, you didn't have Casey or Shredder. Well, saying that Shredder did actually appear in the very first episode, but his costume was absolutely terrible. And after that first episode, you never really see him again, which was probably um, a good thing. Now, when you're watching this series, you might actually recognize a few of the sets from some of the previous movies. And I say this because I am 95% sure 
that the turtle layer that they use in this TV series is the exact same one from the Ninja Turtles 2 and the Ninja Turtles 3. It looks like they've used a few of the set designs from their previous films and just recycled them into this TV series. But saying that, this could also be an indication that this TV series was a carry-on from the movies, like it's all set in the same universe and the story is just continuing from the movies over to the TV series. Or it could just simply be that they reused some of the old sets that were for some reason still standing but I will say there is one more indication that this may be a continuation from the three films that came previously. Now do you recall the scene in the first movie where Shredder kills Splinter's master and Splinter frees himself from the cage and jumps to his face and scratches the Shredder's face but then Shredder slashes at Splinter's ear and cuts a little bit of his ear off. Well if you look at Splinter's ear in the TV series that slash on his ear still remains, so this is a indication that it is possibly a continuation from the movies. Now, like I said before, this TV series is generally hated. Not a lot of people like it. Probably one of the most interesting episodes in the series was a two-parter which saw the Ninja Turtles universe and the Power Rangers universe collide and we got a Turtles and Power Rangers crossover team-up episode. And I'm not going to lie, it was quite entertaining to see the Ninja Turtles and the Power Rangers cross paths. It was quite an entertaining episode. It wasn't great by any means, but it was, it was interesting. Now, after 26 episodes, the Next Mutation TV series had come to an end, and it was ultimately cancelled, and it was probably for the best. After the Next Mutation, we would have to wait around five years before the Turtles would return to our screens. And when it did return, it was probably one of the best Ninja Turtle cartoons we have had, even to this day. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2003 animated series. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2003 animated series. One of the best things to happen to this animated series was that it was co-produced by Mirage Studios, which meant this series was much more closer to the original material from the Mirage comic books. And because of this, this cartoon felt more darker, more edgy and more gritty than any previous TV adaptation that had come before it. But at the same time, they did manage to keep it light and fun. It was just a perfect mix and this show saw the revival of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as a Saturday morning cartoon favourite. Ninja Turtles, Saturday, February 8th, 10.30am, only in the Fox Box. Now, I was 20 years old at the time when this first aired and I was really looking forward to seeing a new Ninja Turtles cartoon on our screens after being disappointed with the next mutation that came previously and all the other stuff we got in between. And I remember being so pleased with the first episode. Now as the episode starts, you see that the turtles are all cornered in an alley by the purple dragon gang. Now this is exactly how the original comic book started. Even the dialogue is the same until they actually jump into action and the fighting starts and I, I love this. Already we had complete loyalty to the comic books. Finally once again, the powers that be seem to be doing something right. Now at this particular time in my life I worked in a toy shop and I remember how great it was to see these brand new Ninja Turtle action figures arrive in stock and I thought this is the Ninja Turtles for a new generation like just as I had enjoyed them back in 1987 now it was time for a new generation of kids to enjoy this show and if I'm totally honest I also felt like a kid again. I, I was very excited about this and I couldn't wait to see the new episode. I mean I remember placing these toys on the shelves, pricing them up and putting them on on the shelves for other kids to buy and just remembering my toys that I had in the past and how different they look now and how much better they look. The first major difference was the characters in this series. They were different to the older cartoon, they were more in line with the comic books. Mikey is like the wise guy, the wise cracking guy, funny, cocky, childish and loves playing pranks. Raphael is changed the most in this. You remember in the 1987 cartoon he was the one always cracking jokes, he was more or less like Mikey in that, that aspect. In this adaptation he has a very fiery explosive temper just like in the comic books but he is also shown to have a caring and loving side to him as well. 
And then we have Leonardo who is super serious and dedicated to his training and takes failure to heart. Not really that much difference to the 1987 cartoon really, he was always super serious about his training, always the leader and he was always worried about his leadership techniques but make no mistake this is the more serious darker version of Leonardo than the 87 cartoon series. And then we have Donatello who is still the inventor, although his inventions are not as far fetched as he was in the 1987 series. He is portrayed as being very clever and probably the man with a plan if they need some kind of plan of attack for the mission he's the guy they always turn to and he can be quiet at times as well. Now the episodes see a very similar path to which the comic books took. We see them take on the Shredder and the Purple Dragon Gang in the streets and on the rooftops of New York and we also get to see episodes featuring the Farmhouse, we get to see episodes featuring the Turtles in Space and alternate realities, the past and the future, just like in the comic books. And just as in the comic books we also get to see some comic book favourites, characters such as the Future Toid who was a creation of Kevin and Peter before they even dreamed up the Ninja Turtle cartoon. He was introduced into the uh, Ninja Turtles franchise, the Triceratons, the Utrons and loads more. Another great thing about this show is the design. Even Peter Lerder said he has never been keen on the 1987 Turtles design. He thought they looked inflatable, but in this version they look solid. They don't look like a joke, they don't look like cartoon characters, they look like big muscular Ninja Turtles. And another nice addition was how their eyes were just white slits. No pupils, just white slits. Once again, just like in the comic book, which was another nice addition. The background images in the cartoons were also dark and gritty, just like the comic books, and the turtles kept to the shadows, unlike the 1987 series where they may just pop down the street and order a pizza. Now all that being said, I think around about season 5 they did actually tone down the violence and some of the themes of the show, and I think this was because some deemed the first few seasons probably a little bit too violent for kids. Another character is drastically changed in this cartoon series. In is this the cartoon Shredder. version, the Shredder is not human. He is an alien Utrom in a Shredder robot body who has actually taken on the persona of a Rokusaki from centuries ago. But we didn't actually find that out until much later into the TV series when Shredder and Leonardo were having a fight on a rooftop and Leonardo actually sliced off the Shredder's head. Now I can tell you now that is something that you would never have seen in the 1987 TV series. No way you would never have seen 1987 Leonardo cut off Shredder's head. Anyway, we think it's over and the Shredder's dead. But just before the episode ends, the Shredder stands and picks up his severed head and walks away with it through the flames. And then we learn later that he's a Neutron. He's a bit like Krang was in the 1987 series. He's uh, like an alien brain that sits in the stomach of the shredder body. So that right there was a big change, they've kind of combined the two characters of the 1987 series and, and mashed them into one. The series actually ran for quite some time, it was finally cancelled in 2008, but that wouldn't be the last we would see of the Ninja Turtles because in 2009 we were treated to something very special. Special one-off Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, Turtles Forever, I believe was broadcast in segments on Nickelodeon and then eventually was released to DVD. This movie really was a treat. You see what they did, they took the Ninja Turtles from the 1987 cartoon and they took the Ninja Turtles from the 2003 series which we just spoke about and they put them both into their own animated film. Now how did they do that? You see in this movie the Ninja Turtles from 1987 series are accidentally transported to the dimension of reality where the 2003 Turtles exist. As the episode starts we see the 1987 Turtles try to stop the 2003 Purple Dragon Gang and they fail and they get captured. After seeing CCTV footage of this fight on the news, the 2003 Ninja Turtles go to the Purple Dragon's hideout and rescue the 1987 Turtles. Meanwhile, the 1987 Shredder and Krang bring the Technodrome to the 2003 universe. Immediately, Shredder from the 1987 universe tries to track down the 2003 universe's Shredder, who, as you may remember, is a Neutron. The 1987 Shredder does this by using some kind of ridiculous Technodrome technology and simply finds the 2003 Shredder light years away from her, frozen in a floating in like an iceberg in space. Now I, I didn't actually see all of the 2003 episodes but I presume that the Shredder was defeated by the Ninja Turtles and this is what ultimately happened to him. And so the 2003 Shredder is transported to the uh, Technodrome 
and it's not long before the 2003 Shredder takes over the show and remodifies the entire 1987 foot soldiers making them more lethal and he also transforms the Technodrome as well and makes it a more dangerous vehicle that more suits the 2003 cartoon. And he becomes obsessed in finding the universe that started it all, which in the cartoon is called Turtle Prime. This is where the Mirage Comics Turtles exist, the very first comic book version of the Ninja Turtles. And yet we see them in this movie at the end and it is, it is it, like I said, it's quite a treat, it's fantastic. Uh, this movie is it's just so much fun. We, we get the 1987 Turtles visiting the 2003 Turtles world, but we also get the 2003 Turtles visiting the very cartoony 1987 world as well. We also get the 2003 Turtles commenting on how strange the appearances of the people in the 1987 universe are, because that is one thing you can say about the 1987 series is that the designs were very strange and the people did not look at all like human beings even though they, they were they were drawn in an unusual way with big heads what were too big for the bodies and and you know like big exaggerated facial features for some of the characters they were drawn in a very exaggerated way and in this cartoon they actually comment on this the 2003 turtles comment on this there is a scene in the cartoon when the 2003 turtles arrive in the 1987 universe where they witness the 1987 april being attacked by some really strange villains. One is actually like a, a big mutated banana and I think it's Michelangelo who actually runs up to him and defeats him by peeling him. And it just showed us once again how silly the 1987 cartoons was, even though people my age absolutely loved them cartoons at the time. We got to saw the Channel 6 news building. We got to see the old 1987 Turtle Van. We got to see the 1987 Turtle Blimp. We got to see 1987 version of Splinter. And for a split second, we see April's best friend, Irma. Uh, she walks past one of the scenes. Uh, there, there's actually loads to take in when they go back to the 1987 world where someone of, like I said, someone of my age would be looking for these little things and appreciate them. And I suppose with it being a 25 year anniversary of the original cartoon, they just gotta include all these little Easter eggs for my generation and that's what made this cartoon such a pleasure to watch. But if I did have one gripe with this animated movie, is that the 1987 Turtles are portrayed as a joke throughout the whole movie. The 2003 Turtles seem to get irritated a lot by the goofy antics. Even the 2003 Michelangelo who at first sees the funny side and enjoys the silly antics of the 1987 cartoon Turtles, he eventually does start getting fed up with them as well and sees them as just a big nuisance. That's one thing I, I didn't like. It, they were portrayed as a joke and you know, 1987 cartoon was a lot more silly and a lot more childish but there were also some serious tones and the turtles were a lot serious than how they are portrayed in this cartoon. Now that is a gripe that I have with this but it's not a major gripe and it didn't take away any of the enjoyment I had from watching the film. It is still a very very good film. Now the best bit in this movie or, or should I say my favourite part in this movie is towards the end of the film where we see all eight Ninja Turtles, the 2003 and the 1987 Turtles transported right back into the original black and white comic book. We see them in the original black and white pages of issue one of the Mirage comic book. And we get the super serious adult version of the Ninja Turtles, which appeared in that first issue. And they actually help the Ninja Turtles defeat Shredder. And they also use quotes directly from the Mirage first issue. And it was great to actually say they animated this bit as well. Once the Turtles arrive in this comic book version of this universe, it's actually animated in black and white and the Mirage Turtles are animated in black and white. It's only the 1987 Turtles and the 2003 Turtles that stay in full colour. On oh, another thing I almost forgot to mention about this um, comic book universe that we're treated to, we actually see the Mirage Studios version of Shredder, which as you may remember in the original comic books, he died in the very first issue. And in this one, we see him um, jump up to challenge the Ninja Turtles. And then we see the 1987 Turtles actually throw trash at him and knock him off the building. So in a way, the 1987 Turtles actually defeated the Mirage Studios Shredder, which I thought was quite funny. Now, unfortunately, we didn't get any of the original voice cast members from the 1987 series. That, that was a real shame. And also, I noticed that none of the original 1987 theme tunes was played at any time during this film. And... 
after a little bit of searching online, I found out that this was actually due to copyright issues. Now, we often see the 1987 Ninja Turtles breaking the fourth wall and talking to the viewer directly. And the 2003 characters have no idea what they are doing or what is going on. And this is something that happened constantly in the 1987 series. But not something you would really see in the 2003 series, so it was funny to see the 2003 characters react to the 1987 Turtles breaking the fourth wall. Now, I mentioned before we see some of the older 1987 characters appear when they go back to the 1987 universe. What I fail to mention is that we also see Bebop and Rocksteady in the human form walk past the camera. We also see the Ninja Pizza Pizzeria, and we see the Ninja Dentist building and all these were featured in the very first episode of the 1987 cartoon and I thought that was really great how they, how they added those in as well. A nice little easter egg to us fans. And whilst we're talking about easter eggs, there's also a scene in the movie where the 2003 Shredder activates the dimension portals or whatever you might call it. And up on the screen you see all the different versions of the Ninja Turtles. It's supposed to be like different realities in the movie. And we actually see all these different variations of the Ninja Turtles that we know. Uh, we get to see the live action Turtles. We get to see the TV series Ninja Turtles. We also get to see different versions of the comic book Ninja Turtles. And there have been a few over the years. We also get to see some anime Ninja Turtles. And that is from the two-parter which we talked about recently. The, the strange manga anime style Ninja Turtles cartoon that we were treated to if you want to say that. And like I said these are all portrayed as different universes and different dimensions which all these Ninja Turtles exist. I mean this movie really was a treat for all the fans out there who have been following the Ninja Turtles for the last 25 years, 25 years at that time when this movie was released. It really was just a treat. The DVD version, I believe, of, of Turtles Forever movie, if you, if you buy it from the UK, I believe it's uncut. A lot of other countries have it, but it has been cut heavily, so I do recommend you try and get it from the UK if you can. 